Well, leave it to pop media to perform two firsts when it comes to perpetuating lies about the U.S. government, even when lives and livelihoods hang in the balance. Hi, everyone. I'm Gardner Goldsmith for MRC TV. You know, in a March 1st headline reading U.S. Senate moves toward ending forever war authorizations, the message massagers at Reuters not only invited readers to think that the U.S. Senate might be considering a bill to prohibit Congress from passing legislation allowing any future open-ended military operations rather than what is actually happening, the possible revocation of two previous so-called authorizations to use military force. But Reuters also perpetuates the myth that the term authorization to use military force is actually in the Constitution. According to reporter Patricia Zengerly, quote, a U.S. Senate committee will consider legislation next week that would repeal two authorizations for past wars in Iraq, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said on Wednesday in a renewed push to reassert Congress's role in deciding to send troops into combat. Well, that's going to take some parsing because it's full of deceptions. Of course, the use of the term wars right there is both incorrect and misleading. As I reported for the Mises Institute in 2007, the George W. Bush administration and its willing accomplices in Congress spat a stunning insult at Americans, the founders, and people worldwide when, in 2002, Bush sent a functionary to Congress to specifically ask members not to abide by the U.S. Constitution. Quote, then White House counsel Alberto Gonzalez approached Congress and asked the representatives to do something not allowed under the U.S. Constitution. He asked them to grant the president the power to use the military without a formal declaration of war. Such a declaration is the only power granted to Congress to facilitate the president's use of the U.S. military. Instead, the Bush administration wanted Congress to grant him a, quote, resolution for the use of military force, end quote, which seems an awfully cumbersome term when one could just, well, declare war. And we will return to that facet of the story in a moment. Add Zingerly, quote, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will take up the 1991 and 2002 authorizations for the use of military force, or AUMFs, Schumer said, paving the way for a possible vote in the full Senate before members leave for the April recess, Schumer said. So, not only is this not a debate about preventing any future unconstitutional AUMF calumnies, it perpetuates the lie that an AUMF is somehow permitted by the U.S. Constitution in the first place. The Constitution is clear, and it's clear for a very important reason. Congress must declare war in order for the president to lead U.S. troops into combat outside the United States. Both the D in declare and the W in war are capitalized because the founders knew the term declaration of war to be very specific. As I noted in 2007, quote, the reason Alberto Gonzalez and the Bush administration did not want a formal declaration was obvious. The United States government is a signatory to the Geneva Accords. According to the treaty, which is easily found by utilizing a simple web search, all uniformed and non-uniformed enemies captured during wartime in any signatory state, and Iraq and Afghanistan are both signatory, would have to be treated according to common Article 3 of the Accords. This ensures certain standards of behavior for those holding prisoners of war, prohibiting torture, and ensuring that all signatory nations will afford humane treatment for their POWs. Readers of my online article about this might want to print copies and hand that to their congressional delegation. And some of you, if you can catch your congressional delegation in moments where they might be open to it, might want to show them this video. Here's more, quote, According to U.S. law prior to 2006, if the individual is captured on the battlefield in this undeclared so-called war on terror, were not going to be treated as POWs, then they would have to be treated under U.S. criminal code. 
just like other terrorists in the past. This, of course, would require the courts to provide habeas corpus hearings to the arrested parties, unless Congress utilized its constitutional power to broadly suspend the writ of habeas corpus for all Americans and those being tried under U.S. law. And where did they put the prisoners? Guantanamo Bay, where many of the Bush, Obama, and other White House officials and Congress members argued the U.S could indefinitely detain and so-called interrogate people without acknowledging U.S. law or the Geneva Accords. So, what we see in this Reuters report is much, much bigger and much more important than the headline portrays it to be. If the Senate is willing to end these so-called authorizations without acknowledging that they were never allowed by the Constitution in the first place, then how can they, with any honesty, claim that the Constitution sanctions their own paychecks and offices, their staff members, their travel expenses, and all the other things that we're forced to fund? If they can overlook their oath when it comes to the central point of the declaration of war, then why can't we overlook the Constitution and tell all of them to buzz off? Thanks for watching, everybody. Please like and subscribe. Find us on Rumble where they don't censor us and share these far and wide with your friends. Hopefully there's some good, valuable intellectual ammunition in this that you can send out to family members, kids, friends, and coworkers. And of course, find us at mrctv.org. That's mrctv.org. The Media Research Center is in its 36th year of fighting for truth and fighting against left-wing bias like what we see in this Reuters report. And we hope that you'll support us by donating to the Media Research Center. We'll also see you in Facebook, on TikTok and Instagram, in Parler, and on Twitter. And on Twitter, I'm at Gard Goldsmith. And on Gab, I'm at Gardner Goldsmith. For MRC TV, I'm Gardner Goldsmith. <laughs>